Good morning. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I spoke here last year, and one thing, I, and I, I felt confident, actually, as a speaker last year. And this year, I feel, for some of the stuff that I'm talking about, less confident. But really, I took the word treatment out of the title. And that's because I, and the last speaker handled this, like spoke this very, very clearly, that I have learned a lot from Tom, from all of you here in the room, about recovery. And I'm trying to look more at the, not just addiction, but actually at the universe through a lens of recovery. So I wanted to begin by stating that drug use is common. Most people use drugs in the United States. And this is looking at lifetime illicit drug use from the National Survey of Drug Use and Health. About 80% of Americans have had a drink of alcohol. Half have used an illicit substance, of which most of that is cannabis. And about two-thirds of people have ever smoked a cigarette. But addiction, although common, is a lot less common. This is sort of cross-sectional data. There's about 20 million people in the United States who meet criteria for a substance use disorder. It's about 7.5% of the population age 12 or over. The majority, the most common substance being alcohol, um, followed by illicit drugs and whatever. And do note that these data don't include tobacco. So most people who use a substance don't become addicted to it. These are data from the 1990s, from VCU, actually, contrasting past 12-month substance use with the, among those who then meet a use disorder. And you can see this is one way that people sometimes talk about how addictive a substance is. And about 30% of people who've smoked a cigarette in the past um, year meet criteria for a nicotine use disorder. It's about 25% of people who've used heroin in the past year who meet a criteria for having an opioid use disorder. And then the number slightly decreases by substance from there. So most people who've used heroin recently actually don't meet criteria for an addiction to heroin. And we see this in the current opioid crisis. We have massively overprescribed opioids, but the likelihood of an individual who is overprescribed opioids becoming addicted to them is relatively small. This is one study, a systematic review, looking at uh, pooling the published literature on this, and it's approximately 12% of people who are, over, who are on chronic opioid therapy who met criteria for an opioid use disorder. So that begs the question why some people become addicted and others don't. And this is the sort of cartoon that the National Institute of Drug Abuse uses to illustrate this. There's something about biology and genes. There's something about environment. Clearly, you have to be exposed to a substance in order to develop an addiction to it. There's something about the brain and brain mechanisms. And I know yesterday, a bunch of time was spent, I think, on the brain mechanisms and on the biology and genes part. And that's great, because I am not going to be talking about that. What I want to do is contrast sort of what we might call public health with punitive health. And I want to look at that cartoon through the lens of right now of, of prevention. And there are two distinct ways you can think about preventing addiction in society. One would be through drugs through prohibition, through supply reduction, and that's the war on drugs, which I'll talk about. And the other would be through, let's say, demand reduction, through something environmental. And I'm gonna focus specifically on adverse childhood experiences. And looking at the total data, 
on why some people become addicted and not others, roughly maybe 30% of addiction can be explained from genetic factors, but 50 to 70% are actually uh, associated with adverse childhood experiences, trauma, et cetera. So adverse childhood experiences, they're stressful or traumatic experiences. They include abuse, neglect, and a range of household dysfunction, such as witnessing domestic violence or growing up with addiction in the household, mental illness, parental discord, crime, et cetera. And they're strongly associated with the development of health outcomes later in life. And these, it was first described as a Kaiser um, CDC funded study. And these are the domains and the prevalence within those domains of adverse childhood experiences. There is across the lifespan development of premature mortality, chronic diseases that are associated with children exposed to neglect and abuse. And actually, adverse childhood experiences are more likely among girls than among boys. So this is looking at um, physical, emotional, and sexual abuse. And these are the prevalence of people in the original study. And you can see amongst, these are women, um, about a quarter had experienced um, childhood um, physical abuse, um, and a quarter had experienced childhood um, sexual abuse. So something that is incredibly common. In epidemiology, we talk about causality. And that means an exposure causes an outcome. And there are certain criteria that need to be met for us to think that an association is causal. And one is that the exposure precedes the outcome, right? The adverse childhood experience precedes the development of adult disease. And another part of causality is a dose-dependent effect, right? That if you increase the dose of the exposure, you increase the likelihood of the effect. That also makes us think that an association is causal. And one of the really interesting things about adverse childhood experiences is that they are dose-dependent. In particular, and from this slide, in the development of drug problems, addiction, or ever injected a drug. So you can see here on the far left-hand side the number of adverse childhood experiences ranging from zero to greater than five. And on the far right-hand side, you can see the odds of ever injecting a drug. And so individuals with five or more adverse childhood experiences have four times the odds of ever injecting, uh, have 10 times the odds of ever injecting a drug in their lifetime. And we actually sort of know this in these funny spaces. This is the opioid risk tool. At VCU, we are integrating this into the ambulatory and, and inpatient uh, medical records as a way of assessing before prescribing opioids whether somebody is at increased risk of developing an addiction from our opioid prescribing. And you can see within this, one of the categories is a history of preadolescent sexual abuse for women. So women get a score of three for that, and men get a score of zero. And that would already put you at low risk of developing, absent any other risk factors, of developing addiction from opioids. So I want to turn from that adverse childhood experiences and the sort of demand reduction lens of prevention of addiction in society to a supply reduction perspective, which is characterized predominantly by the war on drugs.
So there's been a lot of funding over the years for drug research, drug treatment, and et cetera. But really, the biggest piece of federal policy related to drugs is the war on drugs. And by almost any metric, it has been a costly failure. We have spent in excess of a trillion dollars since it was launched, almost most of which going to interdiction, to law enforcement, pieces of it going to treatment, and recovery is not a word that exists in the drug budgets related to the war on drugs. One thing that we have done is increase policing as a consequence of this related to drug crimes. Every 25 seconds in the United States, somebody is arrested for a drug crime. Rates, which is the left-hand side, range quite widely by state. Maryland, surprisingly, has the highest, and Vermont the lowest. 700 per 100,000 per year are arrested in Maryland for a drug-related crime. And every single state has a marked racial disparity in terms of who is arrested, which is on the right-hand side. The red line being if we arrested white people at the same rate of black people. And you can see the states organized by the greatest disparity to the least disparity. And in Virginia, we arrest about three black people for every one white person for a drug-related crime. And this policing, this war on drugs, the one thing that it has led to is mass incarceration. And racial inequities from policing to prosecution to imprisonment. And you can see on the left-hand side the US prison population that starts to increase with the war on drugs being launched by Nixon and increases more rapidly through a series of legislative um, and policy changes, including you know, mandatory minimum sentencing and et cetera, and slightly leveled out in the you know, last years of the Obama administration. And we incarcerate more people than any other country. In particular, we incar the rate of incarceration for black Americans, and especially black male Americans, is 5,000 per 100,000. And one thing, though, that we don't talk about enough is the fact that most prisoners are parents. There has been a lot of attention on incarceration, on prisoners, and et cetera, and a lot less on their children. This is a recent book um, that highlights that gap. Children of the Prison Boom. About one in 30 adults in the United States is in prison, and one in 28 school-aged children have a parent who's in prison. That's 2.7 million children in the United States. And on the bottom, you can sort of see the racial disparity for this. Amongst kids born in 1990, one in four black children saw their father incarcerated before they turned 14. And for white children, it was about one in 30 saw their father incarcerated before they turned 14. This is so common that Sesame Street introduced a new character a while ago named Alex, whose dad's in prison. And they put together a whole web page with videos that's quite moving called Little Children, Big Challenges, colon, Incarceration. So going back to ACEs, one of the ACEs is having a member of your household incarcerated, which was 5% of the original population. So putting this together with the war on drugs, we kind of have this perverse cycle, right? We have drug use in society. Some people develop addiction. We've chosen to sort of deal with this predominantly 
through a supply reduction lens, through the war on drugs, which incarcerates a huge number of people in our society, which causes adverse childhood experience in their children, which leads to drug use and addiction, which we respond to with the war on drugs. And these sorts of policies are in conflict. On the one hand, every single candidate for the last presidential election had a statement saying, you know, addiction is a disease, it's a public health crisis. But on the other hand, we continue to arrest one person every 25 seconds for a drug-related crime. This is the definition of cognitive dissonance, holding two things that are incompatible, one in each hand, and being comfortable with it. Now, there has been movement, historically, to recognize and try and sort of dial this back a little bit. And this is the former um, drug czar, the director of the ONDCP, who in a Wall Street Journal article said, regardless of how you try to explain to people it's a war on drugs or a war on a product, people see a war as a war on them. We're not at war with people in this country. And consistent with that perspective, in 2011, for the first time, um, the Office of the National Drug Control Strategy removed the term war on drugs from its publications and from its sort of budgetary proposals for the following year. That terminology has returned to some federal documents recently. So thinking about this cartoon again, through the lens of prevention. How, what do we do? How, what does prevention of adverse childhood experiences look like? So I borrow, we, we, in epidemiology, we talk about primary prevention, which means preventing something before it starts, and secondary prevention, which means intervening to prevent the illness from developing worsening symptoms. So thinking about it that way and borrowing from the um, Center for Disease Control's protective factors to reduce the effects of fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, you can prevent exposure to trauma. And really what that means is loving, nurturing, and stable home environment during the school years. And it means absence of violence. So that's the primary prevention of adverse childhood experiences. And what about the secondary prevention? Preventing people who've been exposed to trauma from developing the sequelae of that. And that actually means sometimes we focus too much on the negative and not flip it over. That means promoting resilience for people who are at risk by exposure to adversity. And clinically, that means trauma-informed care integrating trauma awareness into what we do medically. But really what that means is humanizing our discourse, right? Treating people with dignity and respect, being attentive to utilizing languages of empathy versus languages of shame. The other piece of the prevention would be thinking about the war on drugs and really rolling back the war on drugs. I showed you this before, right? This is the growth of the US prison population. There's been a slight decline. And if we don't really do anything, it's gonna keep declining. But it's gonna take 75 years at the current rate of decarceration to cut the prison population in half. Therefore, passive response is not acceptable. For every single, like almost every single person in jail is a parent. And we're talking about several generations then of people who are growing up in homes in which parents are incarcerated. The UK has done a really nice job breaking apart sort of why things cost what they do. 
and they have this classification for substances that differs from ours. The class A drug would be heroin, cocaine, amphetamine, et cetera. And looking at the societal cost of drugs, 90% is related to their illicit status. The fact that they are illegal makes it criminal, and that's what drives the cost. Not as much the cost of health services, you know, where I work, death that we're all aware of, or the social determinants, the social care, I mean. All of which are very, very important. So it's for reasons, both economic and ethical and moral, that people have considered decriminalization. And perhaps the best example is the country of Portugal, the poorest country in Western Europe which had a, the highest rate of overdose death and addiction of, of all the European countries um, around the turn of this century. And they embarked on an ambitious plan of decriminalizing and of opening access to treatment and of educating health providers and um, the community about stigma associated with substance use and use disorder. And what they have seen in the last almost two decades is a market reduction by almost all metrics. These are two here. One are overdose drug-related deaths. It has the, Portugal has the lowest rate of drug-related deaths of any European country, and is a hundredth the rate of what we have in the United States. They've also seen a massive decrease in the number of HIV cases that are attributable to drug use. 50% of their cases in 2000 were attributable to drug use. Today, it's 5%. So some of the problems with a punitive lens is that we target use, but we don't necessarily capture addiction or use disorder. Right? Most people who use drugs don't develop addiction. If we're concerned about addiction, targeting use is not a way to get to the population of interest. We actually target illicit use by definition, and we, so it doesn't actually reflect what the population-based harms of substances are. And I'll show you shortly, like tobacco and alcohol have a far higher population health burden than illegal substances do. And I think we've seen quite clearly how punitive policies reinforce discrimination. Now, I said before how we're quite comfortable holding on the one hand addictions a disease and on the other hand the war on drugs. But that's not entirely correct because there are generations and certainly contemporary thinkers and leaders who are not at all comfortable with that status quo. In fact, it has to do with racial segregation in the United States, lays the groundwork for racially based policing, that makes it a lot easier, that leads to the mass incarceration that we see. And I really like these are opportunities we have to radically rethink the structures under which we accept existence. And so I, this is a great little essay of Angela Davis's, Are Prisons Obsolete? What would society look like if we didn't incarcerate people? Really what we need to do is think about drug-related harms realistically as a basis of public policy. The licit, illicit distinction is a socially and legally determined one. It's not reflective of addiction science. It's not reflective of what happens in your brain and the rest of your body. And again, the UK has been one of the leaders, I think, of how to think about harms related to substances, differentiating harms to users versus harms to others. And this is stratifying substances across, they have a scale for this. And you can see alcohol would be the most harmful from this model. And the bulk, the majority of the harm of alcohol is actually harm to others, right? Drunk driving, 
like violence associated with intoxication in public spaces. Heroin, cocaine, and going down. So our war on drugs does not reflect population harms associated with substances. Nor does it actually reflect mortality or disability adjusted life years, which is a way that we capture how much life is lost due to an exposure. And you can see from these, they, they pulled alcohol and drug use together. But tobacco is a greater cause of um, death in the United States, as well as disability adjusted life years. So really, when we think about what should public health and public policy look like, really, public policy should re reflect what the true harms are. And it should be focused on treatment and on recovery. So I wanted to talk a little bit about recovery. And this slide is purposely blank. And it's blank to, in some ways, make me uncomfortable. <laughs> because I said I spoke here last year, and I, um, and I really mean it that I don't feel as much this year that I am uh, an authority. Because I've been learning a lot. And I'm very glad, and here in the audience today, we opened a clinic a little over a year ago. And there's some patients of ours in the audience. There's some staff in the audience. And Tom and others, I've learned an incredible amount in this past year. What I used to think about recovery was that it was the inverse of the untreated addiction state. And, and that's not untrue, but that is insufficient. What I think about recovery more now is that, the, and the last speaker illustrated this very well, it has something to do with community. Right? Something to do with connections. Something to do with existences that are, and are meaningful and contributing to something greater than yourself. And where recovery happens is really in the community, but in the communities that we build and we maintain and we discover. And there's this idea also of radical recovery. Bill White's been mentioned, and that's his concept. And the idea of moving from self-healing to social action. And I think that, that the idea of recovery can be a way, a lens, through which to think about social action, through which to think about addressing not just addiction, but the adverse childhood experiences and responses to the war on drugs. Because we, the US today, we are sick, right? This historical time um, is, has an illness somewhere. We have less than 5% of the global population. And we consume over 75% of the world's prescription drugs. We include, in, consume over 80% of the prescription opioids on the planet. So what is it? What is it about this time, this place, that has this big hole that we have to fill in this way? I mentioned in the beginning how most people use drugs or have used drugs. There's some really interesting anthropology of addiction and recovery. And through um, Irene Glasser's work, a survey of all known human cultures, there's only one that did not use a substance that was psychoactive. And it was an island in what's now Papua New Guinea that didn't have any plants that produce psychoactive compounds. But addiction, as an illness, is actually a relatively recent phenomenon. We can argue a little bit over when it emerges. I would say it emerges in the early 1800s. But some people can push the date back by a century or two, but not much longer. And we have you know, a good 10,000 years of human existence that's documented. So there is something about modernity. There's something about society that relates to addiction. 
And some of it has to do perhaps with a contrast between the fragmented existences that we lead and a more holistic approach to life. And this is actually where I think about recovery. To me, that represents a holistic approach to life. Recovery actually as a concept is something that makes sense not just to people who have had addiction, but makes sense somewhere to everybody. So I didn't want to spend much time talking about the current opioid crisis, but there's been a lot of attention to it that you know, increase in opioid prescribing, increase in opioid addiction, increase in overdose-related opioid death. The point I want to make is that unless we address real root causes, we know that addiction epidemics come and go. The drug changes, but the addiction, the behavioral health, the adverse childhood experiences, the fragmented traumatic existences remain. And as public health you know, community members and professionals, if our response to this crisis is just about opioids, we are missing a massive moment to actually be set up to deal with subsequent um, epidemics, much less actually understand what's going on now. And this was captured quite nicely, I thought, surprisingly to me, in the National Academies of Medicine report on the opioid crisis. Overprescribing was not the sole cause of the problem. While increased opioid prescribing for chronic pain has been a vector of the opioid epidemic, researchers agree that such structural factors as lack of economic opportunity, poor working conditions, and eroded social capital in depressed communities accompanied by hopelessness and despair are the root causes of the misuse of opioids and other substances. So I think you're familiar with the, uh, Obama's last Surgeon General who published a, a report called Turn the Tide, right, that was focused on opioid prescribing. But really, if we want to quote unquote turn the tide, that means we need to focus on suffering. Or to flip that, I think that means that we need to like look at the universe through the, what, what can recovery teach us about overcoming suffering? And with that, I'm gonna end. Thank you.